Welcome everyone, this is Tim Pullman and you're listening to the SEP Couch. This podcast is all about standard essential patents. We talk about patent strategies, friend licensing, patent pooling and patent litigation. So let's dive into today's episode. Hello and welcome everyone. This is Tim Pullman and you're listening to the SEP Couch, the podcast that is about standard essential patents and friend and you know all these topics that are close to my heart. But I know these topics are also very close to my next guest's heart, Justus Baron. I'm very happy to have you, Justus. Justus has been not only a colleague of mine for the past 12 years, but also a good friend. Actually, I've been starting to work on the whole SEP topic together with him for many years. So it's good to have you. Justus, welcome. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Um, like every guest, um, I start with asking a bit about your personal career. Um, you know, why have you actually started working on standard essential patents, answering these questions about when patents and standards come together? Um, maybe walk us through a little bit, you know, what your background is and what you have been doing in the past years. Sure, absolutely. So I first got to think about the issue of standard essential patents as a graduate student when I was uh, working on my master's thesis at Sciences Po in Paris back then. And I was interested very broadly in the intersection between innovation and competition. And what fascinated me back then and still fascinates me until today is um, this, this intriguing issue of uh, cooperative behaviors between firms that are uh, actually uh, part of this competitive playing field. So uh, get away a little bit from this issue, how much competition is good for innovation and actually say, okay, there are all these cooperative behaviors that do not necessarily take away from competition between these firms. And obviously standardization, the development of technology standards is a perfect example of that. And my advisor, Jan Menier, back then, he uh, quickly drew my attention to standard essential patents, SAP licensing as a particularly hot issue in that particular field. And that's how I got started. And I uh, pretty immediately started doing very empirical work, uh, collecting data. And uh, I uh, had the opportunity to spend some time at uh, Technical University of Berlin, where Knut Blind. Uh, uh, also uh, worked on has been working on these issues, and uh, he uh, he advised me also to to look into patent pools as a particular source of information. And so we, and that's pretty much where I got to meet you pretty quickly, and we we started working together, uh, coming through the SAP declaration databases, trying to make sense of them and uh, uh, find patterns, find find empirical relationships that are worth exploring, and and. That's what I've been doing for most of my last 12 years. I mean, like it's, it's, it uh, took some turns. I, uh, after finishing my PhD thesis, I, um, I got a, an offer from Northwestern University. Uh, Dan Spilber had uh, created a, a new research program at that time, uh, which was about innovation economics with a very heavy focus on standards development. And uh, as part of that research program, uh, he had the vision of creating a centralized, uh, standardized database where researchers could find information about innovation and standards development. And it was pretty much my job to, uh, to create that database and to uh, make it happen. And uh, I used a lot of the data that you and I, we had been working on over the previous years, but then also I worked with a great team of research assistants over a couple of years to create that, what, what would then become the Soul Center database, which is a database that people can use. And hopefully uh, we will see a lot of great research papers coming out using this data. And yeah, ever since beginning 2014, I have been with Northwestern University, continuing to do work in the space. I have become more and more interested in policy questions, and I've uh, participated in many of these. I think we're going to get into that in a moment. But yeah, for, for now, I'm still with Northwestern. I'm still doing research in that field. And that's, that's pretty much what, what I've been doing. Very good. And yes, um, 
just to add to that story, uh, in 2009, you and me met together at the TU Berlin. And actually, Justus is one reason I even have or have had that PhD position. He worked at the TU Berlin, and Professor Blind wanted to have you as a PhD, but you went off back to Paris, you know, for good reasons um, to do your PhD in Paris. But then the PhD position in Berlin was open. I was hired, so I can still thank you for that because Professor Brind liked to have keeping your wanted to keep you working for him, created that PhD position, and you know you left. I got it. So that was that was a great start in 2009 when we met and then started working together on this. But very I'm sure interesting. That, I'm sure that you would have found your ways even even without that. <laughs> yes, sure, but it's still um, it's still what what happened, and I think it's. It's also good to have someone, um, you know, like a, a peer to to exchange ideas. Um, Absolutely. And, and I think also you and me back in 2009 were one of the first who put hands on that back then very dirty and messy Etsy declaration database. Um, uh, I think first published results in the EU Commission report in I think 2010 or something. So that was very early empirical work on this. And, you know, mm. uh, I'm glad to see now that it, you know, has become a much better database available at Northwest and Chicago. I think that is exciting. Um, maybe also worth mentioning that you do very regular um, roundtables um, because a lot of people are using that data already in their research and they're presenting their papers and findings. So I think that is that mm -hmm. is great work what you have been doing there and you know starting to do there. Anyone who is a, is a researcher, by the way, in economics, um, that data is freely available for, for researchers. So, you know, shoot a message to, to justice and there's, um, I think, a system to get access to it. And not only economists. I mean, there are sociologists, uh, management scholars, political scientists. There are many applications. I mean, as, you, as you're well aware, standardization has all these ramifications. It's important in so many aspects. Yes, yes, you're right. Not, not... Um, limiting to economists for sure, um, but that is exciting, and I'm you know I'm glad to be helping and supporting also with some of the iPolitics data on that database. That that is great, but maybe um coming back to your research, you're you're with Northwestern and you are very actively publishing papers. You're speaking on panels. Maybe describe a bit what are your what are your topics? What are the questions that you try to answer with data? Economic questions typically. Um, how would you describe that work? Sure. Um, so broadly speaking, right now, my work is divided into three different streams of research, I would say. Um, the first stream is what I've been doing for most of the past 10 years is empirical work on, on standard essential patterns, uh, standards development, uh, strategies of companies trying to uh, trying to uh, empirically study, analyze, measure uh, patterns and behaviors in that sphere. And then the second aspect is something that I've got more and more interested in over the past years is the question of governance, and in particular the governance of standards development organizations, which includes questions such as, okay, who get who, who's making the rules? How are the rules made? Um, what can we say about the efficiency of the rules? What can we say about the efficiency of the processes for making the rules? What is the legitimacy of, of these different processes for making the rules? I mean, uh, theoretical and empirical work that, and even historical work that, that helps us um, understanding these different complicated questions. And then the third aspect is related to evaluation of standard essential patterns of SAP licenses, where you have uh, as you are well aware, I mean, there are these different approaches to, uh, to valuation and uh, each of these approaches has at least some economic component where you have to use economic methods to uh, make sense of different arguments by different parties. And I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to contribute to that with my research as well. Very good. These are important topics, important questions to answer. Um, but you're not only um, um, frequently, actively um, participating in academic research um, conferences or uh, groups. You are also um, in some governmental organizations invited. Um, and there's one particular one, which is a selected group of members. It's called the EU Commission's Expert Group on Standard Essential Patents. 
um, and you're part of that group. Could you explain um, what this group does and who else is part of that group? And you know, what, what is the objective and what also was the outcome of that group's work? Sure, I mean, what this group did, I have to say, because uh, the work of the group has concluded. We have published our contribution to the debate. So they're, we're currently not meeting in that group. And I don't, I don't think that there's gonna be another publication coming out from that group, but uh, sure. So, um, in 2017, the European Commission had issued a communication on standard essential patents, where uh, it described certain principles and uh, expressed certain views on how standard essential patent licensing should be conducted, and uh, found some issues, some inefficiencies that should be addressed, either in uh, industry self-regulation approaches or uh, uh, including potential regulatory reforms by the Commission. And in order for the Commission to better understand these issues and, and help the Commission to come up with ideas how to address these issues, um, the, the Commission created this expert group, which was uh, a, a fairly common process uh, in European policy making. So there is a call for applications and the interested expert can apply to become a member. And then based on your track record of expertise in that field, you, you might be invited to join the expert group, which then has uh, started a meeting or, and we, we, we met regularly over about two years and exchanged ideas and uh, individual experts came up with different policy proposals, things, suggestions for the Commission. And we created this document, which is called the Contribution to the Debate, which is in, uh, in, to a large extent is a collection of in, individual experts' contributions, which were all debated within the group. And the feedback from the group helped experts refine their positions and better formulate their views. and the objections or uh, criticisms from other group members were included in the contribution, but by and large, uh, uh, the, the proposals that are included in the report are proposals of individual members. And there were, um, initially, I think we were 15, and uh, some people had to leave because of health reasons or uh, other issues, personal issues, but uh, we, uh, we were a, a good group of, uh, mostly practitioners. So there were lawyers, there were uh, people directly working for, for companies on the different sides of the issue. Um, there were uh, four economists, I think, and I was one of, I think, only two full-time academics that participated in that. So my, my role was mostly to contribute with data analysis and uh, provide some empirical basis for the discussions, even though also I'm happy to see some of my own proposals being included in the report. Very good. Um, and you published this, um, I think, earlier this year. Um, what what is the what was the general reaction by the industry? And you know, or maybe also, what was your objection in general? Obviously, these topics are so important. These topics are so debated. It's probably impossible to publish anything that someone finds anything that they don't agree with. Um, but what are, what are the typical points that are critically discussed and where you have strong opinions from both sides of the table? So um, I think when we started, there was a lot of controversy or a lot of apprehension. And uh, uh, some people came out immediately saying, oh, this group is terrible. This group is biased. I mean, how could you create such a terrible group? I mean. I, I think this is a little bit part of the game that people try to uh, immediately get ahead of whatever somebody might say. And uh, yeah, it's a bit unfortunate, but it, it's just part of what it is. But I think that um, the commission handled that very aptly and, and also the, uh, the expert group itself uh, has, has managed to steer away from most of the most controversial issues by, by creating this very open document, which which clearly and very explicitly includes a, a very broad diversity of different people's views, and uh, 
So I, I don't think that you can say that the uh, that the report is is, is particularly biased in, in any particular uh, direction. Uh, what has been said after the report has come out is that it's not going far enough, which is probably a little bit the consequence of this very open balanced approach that we have taken that uh, some people express disappointment that we haven't been able to resolve any of these outstanding controversies. I'm not sure to what extent that a reasonable expectation that we in our small group of individual experts could resolve conflicts that the industry has not been able to resolve, but uh, uh, in any event, uh, there was in some of the commentary I've read, there was a sense of disappointment that uh, that there's uh, no consensus on, on these most thorny issues. What the issues were, I mean, I think this is, uh, these are just the issues that, that were debated at that time, which to a large extent are still the issues that are debated today. I think uh, one of the most controversial issues was the uh, question of the level of licensing in the value chain, where, um, as you know, there is ongoing litigation and uh, complaints by, uh, uh, implementers of the of the standards and particular implementers in industries that are recently exposed to SCP licensing issues who complain that uh, SEP holders are unwilling to license at uh, at the particular level in the, in the in the value chain where they would prefer to be licensed and SCP holders on the other hand are complaining that the and users to whom they would prefer to license are hiding behind their suppliers. And, and so this is a, a ongoing controversy, which, uh, which obviously was uh, also addressed in our report, where we immediately got that out of the way by saying we're not taking a position here. We're, we're saying, like, let's, let's try to find a way to be neutral with respect to this important debate. In, in that regard, um, we've seen the Commission um, in, in Europe more and more requesting for what they call transparency. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a good word. It sounds good. But um, could you elaborate what the Euro European Commission means by transparency and maybe also discuss a bit the different aspects of, of transparency and what it could mean or what are also pros and cons of transparency, which may not always be the solution to, you know, to, to answer questions like what is FRAND really? Mm -hmm. I mean, I obviously cannot speak on behalf of the Commission or not, not I don't have any insight knowledge about what the Commission means by transparency. I can, I can broadly, generally speak about what what for me transpires from the from the debate, what what people seem to think uh, is important, and and what my own take on that is. Um, I think there are many different aspects to transparency. I, what what currently is uh, on top of people's mind is transparency about uh, the number of essential patents, really. So, uh, as you know, there are these. Uh, SDO policies requiring companies to disclose patents that they believe might potentially become essential to a technology standard. And they have to disclose that patent so that they can make a licensing statement on whether they are willing to make licenses available to these patents for any future implementers of that standard, should the patent become essential. And these uh, disclosures are increasingly being used to infer how many essential patents there are for a standard, how many patents there are that implementers need licenses for. And obviously, they are not particularly fit for that purpose. And uh, that, that creates this big discrepancy between what people uh, expect, the type of information that people expect to get from, from this type of data and, and what they actually find in that data. So there's, uh, there's an effort to, to improve the informative content of, of these databases by, uh, for example, asking SEP holders to uh, make more specific declarations, pinpoint individual sections of a standard to which their patent might be essential, to update their declarations once they have more knowledge about what the standard is or, or whether what what claims of the patent have been have been granted and ultimately going as far as requesting step holders to submit their declared SPs to essentiality checks if they want indeed to assert these patents against implementers. so that's one notion of, of transparency 
which is particularly prominent in the policy debate. Um, I, I think you and I, we have written on that. We, we have tried to help people make sense of the different methods that exist for answering these questions regarding the number of standard essential patents that different companies hold, uh, which I don't wish to be seen as an indication that this is the one and only question that people need to address if they want to uh, conclude a successful SCP license. I think that as a practical matter, the number of actual truly essential patents that different companies hold is an important data point. It has become a data point that is frequently relied upon, but obviously there are many more pieces of information that people would need to have in order to really get to an informed decision about what a set license is worth. Um, other, in my mind, probably more important notions of transparency involve transparency about the availability of comparable licenses, for example, which are, at least in my view, by far the most important input to evaluation of an SAP license. And, uh, and also transparency about the users of the standard. I mean, from the SAP holders perspective, it can be challenging to, to track where the patented technology is used, by whom, to what extent, to what effect, and, and what value that use creates for the user. All these are, are aspects that are, that are important that an SAP holder would need to take into account when formulating a licensing offer. And all that can be challenging for, for a patent holder to assess. Yes. Yeah, and then I think um, people should not forget the challenge is typically also on both sides of the table because in the end, everyone wants to make a deal. You know, it's all about um, getting the technology out there and people should use it and innovate on top of that. I think we should not forget about that. Um, but just, you know, back, back to the research that you and I did, I think what I, what is, what is, um, Interesting when we talk about transparency that, as you said, you know, the, the, the self declarations have been used as a starting point, which is maybe not per se a bad thing, but of course it can easily create confusion because these patents are by far not, you know, verified as central. In our paper, we, for example, use a sample um, where, you know, subject matter experts do claim charting exercises and 12.5% are fully mappable only, right? So that is a very low percentage of a larger, you know, group of patents that are declared, which is general, I think, a good system. But um, I think making people aware of these things is also part of the transparency work um, that you and I have been doing. Um, you know, making people aware what transparency means and what the publicly available data actually means, I think, part of the game. Um, but yeah, I think what I also be excited to see is also more information on what, you know, about deals that are actually successful, because most of the time, you know, um, deals are closed, FRAND works. There's these exceptional cases that go to litigation that everyone reads about. And, you know, it kind of creates a reality that may not always be the truth because the larger part of those deals actually are signed and sealed, um, but obviously often kept secret, right? Absolutely. And I mean, just to be clear, I, I don't think that this is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we, uh, it's it's obviously licenses are a particularly complex and particularly sensitive type of business contracts relationships and it's uh, it's it's just a reflection of general business practice that these uh, negotiations, especially the most successful negotiations, are not taking place uh, in in public view. So. Um, we, we also need to weigh these considerations when pushing for more transparency uh, because the one type of negotiations that are transparent that we do get to see are the controversial ones, are the other ones where uh, people ask for third party uh, determination of, of the things that are controversial, whereas uh, the ones that are successful and the ones that are uh, resolved without third party intervention are the ones where we company do that in private. So I, I think that this is something that needs to be borne in mind that the more transparent negotiations are not necessarily the better ones, but necessarily among the more efficient ones. Yes, no, yeah, that is the challenge of the system, I guess. Um, but very interesting work. And that um, leads me also um, to the next um, 
work that um, you and me are about to start. Um, there is a new um, study that was commissioned by the European Commission's DG Grow um, uh, to a consortia to assess the economic impact assessment on standard central patents. Um, this is um, a study that you and me will work on together, but um, I'm asking you here, maybe for everyone who's listening, can you give some insights, um, you know, who is, who else is in our consortia, maybe to start with, um, what are the topics that we will work on, what are the questions of the European Commission that this economic study tries to answer empirically? Sure. Um, so as a general matter, it's uh, the, the process of impact assessment, uh, just as the process of the expert group is, is, is a very regular common feature of policy making in, in the EU. It's uh, uh, something that uh, the EU tries to do uh, very rigorously and very systematically is to, to conduct these impact assessments at different stages of the policy making process. So in the particular case, it's uh, it's it's an ex ante impact assessment, which means that it's uh, uh, an evaluation of different policy options in different fields, and for each of these different issues, different policy issues, um, we we have to uh, think about potential ways of addressing the issue and uh, how we could. Uh, measure or quantify the potential impact that these different potential policy options would produce. And uh, obviously we are uh, we're just assisting the commission with that process. It's not us, it's not up to us to write that ex ante impact assessment. We are, our role is to, is to produce whatever data the commission might request in that process so that the commission can make a more informed ex ante impact assessment. And uh, we have assembled uh, what I think is a great team for, for, for doing that work. Uh, so uh, yours and IPolitics uh, are the consortium leaders uh, who uh, have extensive experience with producing data and uh, in particular data on standard essential patent, standard essential patent licensing. And, uh, and then I have, uh, I have a role as a lead researcher in that consortium where uh, I, uh, I bring in my, my extensive experience with analyzing that type of data. We also have uh, Peter Arke Castells, who is a friend of mine from, my, from our common days at Northwestern University. He now has moved on and is an assistant professor in Groningen. And technology markets more generally. We also have uh, a legal scholar, Amandine Leonard, who is uh, an assistant professor in Edinburgh. And we have Eric Sergerard, who is uh, a professor in, at the University de Lille, as well as a consultant for Darts IP, parts of Clarivate. And Darts IP is also part of our consortium and it contributes with their extensive empirical information on, on patent litigation in general, and in particular, SEP litigation. So once again, I guess we uh, we basically answer all the questions that the commission asks us to the extent that we can, and, and the nature of these questions is usually empirical. So it's providing data that might allow the commission to uh, make a more informed assessment of different policy options in in the field of SAPs. Yes, and I think that looks like a very exciting study that we will be starting to work on, um, you know, of course, also from our perspective, in particular, the empirical parts, um, also with, with um, Darts IP, Darts, Darts IP has been working with iPolitics on, you know, marrying together the world of standard central patent declaration data and, um, you know, these more in-depth litigation data. Um, but as economists, I think, it's always our um, task to um, get together as much information and data as possible, think about it hard, analyze it, discuss limitations, but also discuss what it could tell you to get closer to understand that whole system, which is complex. I think we all know that. Um, it is not an easy task to solve problems um, or especially where people have very different views on. So we try to do our best to be um, informative and um, factual as possible, I guess. Sure. 
Very good. Um, in, in, in general terms, um, uh, if you think about um, the, the world of standard central patents, um, you know, what has been going on in particular with Europe, we're both based in Europe. Um, you know, what, what are in your view the, the important topics that are currently discussed um, what are the, the what is friction? Uh, what is also maybe some po positive news? What has worked, um, and what can we expect maybe also next year? If you think about this year and next year, what what are your ideas around that? So I, I already mentioned the the thorny issue of the level of licensing in the value chain, which I think has dominated uh, at least uh, litigation space over the last few years um maybe we're coming a little bit to to a resolution there i mean positions seem to be moving a little bit i think some of these very uh strong positions that stakeholders had taken in the beginning are softening a little bit so i think uh there might be uh, there might be a little bit less of that litigation of that type of litigation in the future i think what's increasingly coming up is it's a question of the appropriate venue for resolving these uh, licensing disputes. There's increasing uh, competition between different courts, or at least uh, there's uh, divergence of views between parties of litigation where that litigation should be resolved. And, and uh, there are all these uh, anti-suit injunctions where one party tries to prevent another party from bringing suit in a particular venue and then there's anti-anti-suit injunction where parties try to prevent another party from doing that so uh, this is obviously uh, a, a quite salient trend right now that there's more and more of that going on and um, i think that what's important to bear in mind is that all these individual controversies they are in to some extent they they are placeholders for for the more fundamental questions and the, the fundamental questions i think they are too and, and they are uh they will not go away and, and these are the first is uh, is valuation i mean what what are standard essential patents worth how much should one party pay to the other for standard essential patents I think that it has been argued and quite persuasively that the entire issue of uh, licensing in the value chain would go away if people agreed on what the price of the license should be as, as, as soon as there's agreement on the price and there's some uh, consensus that it doesn't really matter who pays for that price. And uh, the other issue, obviously, is, is the issue of governance. It's the issue of who gets to make decisions, who gets to decide. And one aspect, one facet of that is, uh, is the geopolitical notion of, OK, which country gets to influence the global set licensing ecosystem, which, which country gets to impose its rules, its standards, its IPR, uh laws and regulations on that global level playing field and that's uh, obviously becoming more and more important because we have this increasing participation in the in the industry of players who who come from countries in which norms and laws are just very different and there's uh, behind or underneath this uh, dispute between individual parties, there's, uh, there's uh, conflict, I would say, almost uh, between, between different visions of what is the role of patent protection, what is, uh, what is the appropriate strength of that patent protection, what is the appropriate level of remuneration for these patents. And that's just... Uh, a quite fundamental question of economic governance uh, where different countries have very different positions. So we can say next year will still be exciting. Um, I think also this year was already, um, we had some quite interesting cases, um, in particular in Europe, with the auto industry here, um, with exactly the questions you describe, who should pay what, at what level, um, who gets agreements, we have patent pools in play. So that's a complex system. And I think important questions to answer also. Um, 
and also probably a, a tough time for the for the regulators who get also questioned by these you know by courts by these parties in litigation um and i think the impact of answering those questions have have to be well thought through um that's maybe also why people like us get commissioned these kind of studies to support um at least some some of that um I believe, but you know, very exciting topics. Um, just this, um, it, it's 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 been a great talk here. Thanks for being so transparent about your work, um, the data you produce, the questions you're answering in your research. Um, very exciting. I'm always happy to be part of some of that. Um, working with you, um, and to end this, um, I would love I would love to hear from you. Um, what you would like our listeners here to keep remembering um, about the topic of. SCPs and FRAND and you know the whole ecosystem around it. Sure. So what I'd what I'd like people to know about my work or remember from, from our conversation is that I'm doing empirical data work on these issues. And I, I think that there is um, there's a promise to, to use uh, solid objective empirical data to address at least part of these contentious issues that the industry is facing. So there's uh, uh, there's data available, there's data out there. I mean, you and your company, you are doing absolutely fantastic work in, in making that data available. And there are people who, who are familiar with this type of data who, who can produce analyzed space on that type of data that can inform uh, Debates not only uh, policy debates, so it can assist policymakers with finding uh, appropriate solutions. It can also uh, assist industry participants with coming to uh, to successful resolution of their disputes. And I, I think that this is an important thing to keep in mind that this promise exists. At the same time, obviously, I, I'd like to stay humble about our role in that sphere. Like, as I, uh, I, I don't claim that. Um, these political or business uh, disputes can be resolved by data analysis alone. I mean, it's obviously a tool that, that has, has its place, but it's also important for us to participate in the debate and to listen and to, um, and to assist the, the decision makers with whatever they think is, is relevant in terms of data and analysis. Great. Justice, thank you so much for your thoughts, ideas, as always, clear and bright and interesting. Um, I think people will keep hearing about our work for the European Commission over the next month, um, for sure, until next year, when this is planned to be published um, sometime close to the next European Commission's um, public consultation. So, you know, stay, stay, stay tuned. It was great having you, Justice, here. Um, thank you so much um, and have a great day. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim. Thank you for, uh, for everything you've been doing over the last years and for your friendship and collaboration on all these projects. It's, it's been great working with you. And Same great here. being here today. Let's do more, Justice. Absolutely. Absolutely.